All right. Um, today, welcome to the uh, sort of advice to budding futurists, uh, and it's it's mainly a call uh, out of out of my journey as becoming a futurist and looking at the world is understanding that I, th I think from most people's perspective, these times they feel very different. Uh, there's a sort of fog in the air for, for most and to be able to make sense of of what's going on is becoming more and more challenging and essentially we need a different way of thinking a uh, different operating model system to the old ways of do, defining strategy managing change and, and creating innovation and um, yeah i'm so grateful today to have jacques from fake here uh, the founder of of Square Nine, uh, and I think uh, before we get into the nitty gritty of what futures is, how to plot your career as a futurist, um, yeah, Jacques, if you can just introduce yourself today, so we have a bit of context. All right, Daniel, thanks. All right, so uh, as you mentioned, Square Nine um, is my consulting firm. Um, it used to be an out and out project development consulting company, if you want, uh, mm. that I established in 2011. Uh, but but around about 2015 or so, I started realizing that that there is a distinct need for people to to understand more about the future. And, and it came on the back of a of a number of discussions I've had with an old Brazilian Brazilian gentleman by the name of Elisa Batista, who is sort of my mentor. Um, I was involved in the energy industry then, uh, mm -hmm. both fossil fuel and renewables. And and he always used to say to me, whenever we had a meeting, he used to say to me, my boy, anticipate the trend. And it's mm -hmm. something that I'll, that I'll always remember. Um, and so from, from 2015 onwards, I started looking at, at, at futures related projects per se. I still okay. did projects on my own. Um, however, uh, over the over the last sort of five or so years, I've I've, I've looked at at helping companies, clients, customers, organisations uh, make sense of of what the future is. If if you know, and and, and that that takes that that's going to take yeah. another discussion on its own. <laughs> but exactly. but eventually we'll get there. Yeah. But but that's where I am at the moment. So so I'm still busy with with some fully immersive projects. Um, Although I, I still um, pursue a futurist career um, more and more so, I think, yes. um, given, given the, the times that we live in, um, you know. So, so that's me in a nutshell. And uh, and yeah, we happy to answer any questions and, and comments and and uh, discussions that you wanna that you wanna pursue for sure. Great. Yeah. Thanks for that, Jacques. Um, and just a quick one. I'm Daniel Shaw. Uh, I am a futurist and uh, recently just uh, finished my time off at a biotechnology startup uh, and was part of the sort of founding team and uh, was an amazing journey of, of building a, a sort of futuristic uh, platform for recombinant proteins. Um, and in my own journey of, of sort of establishing myself as a futurist, I realized there's so many questions, so many uh, unknowns. Uh, it's it's such a new and well, relatively new field with so much nuance um, and and its own complexity. Uh, so, for those that sort of have seen, I guess futures or the term futurist or futuristic thinking, um, I think it might be a good start just to sort of get a, what is. What is it to be a futurist and what is uh, the future studies field uh, from a broad sense uh, for, for those who who maybe think they they like this, but they're not sure exactly what it is. Right. OK, so uh, <laughs> where to start? probably one of the yeah. most common, common questions out there. And, and I think one of the one of the most common mis misperceptions is that that people people sort of say but how, how can you how can you predict the future and yeah. and that's not what we do we 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 anticipate th that's why it's futures studies and not future studies mm. um we mm. anticipate a number of futures or possible futures 
Um, and then we, dep depending on, on, on your client or depending on, on the particular project that you're involved with, um, we will then reverse engineer the possible future or the preferred future that you might have. So in other words, your goal. Yeah. We will then reverse engineer that and say, okay, how, how do you get there from here? All right, because okay. remember that today, <clears throat> today is still the only contact that you have with both. I mean, it's simple, but both the future yeah. and the past. All right. So, so, so the training that, that, that I underwent, um, it's very basic Two institutions. I um, might as well mention them for people that, mm. that, that might be interested is the Institute for the future. Um, they have a number of courses. There's a speciality course that you or a series or a track that you go through. Yeah. And then, uh, one by meta futures, uh, led by Suhail Inayatullah, which is probably one of the most preeminent futurists yes. out there. Um, I think, you know, uh, you, mm. you probably would have followed a course that that's much the same as what, what, what he presents. But, but in essence, what we want to do is, is you want to look at these preferred futures, but, but you want to look at it from, from an historic point of view. So where okay. from is the first question that you're going to ask, all right? Whether it be a company, whether it be an institution, organization or whatever, even a government, where from? So, so what brought us here? Where are we on our way to? And, and what are the assumptions around that? Mm. Then we, we start forging and, and, and honing and whittling down and, and trying to prevent or, or trying to, to produce our own uh, preferred future. Okay. So Hale, you know, it all speaks about the used future. Um, now, briefly, what that means is you either craft or create a preferred future for yourself or you, you or the future happens to you. All right? The push and the pull. Now, the push and the pull, exactly that. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so, so, what is it that you're going to do to craft your own preferred future? Okay, and that is your want. Then we start looking at company X is sitting in this position. They want to achieve that. How do we get there? In other words, what are the processes and the steps? Yeah. And we often use meta. You'll you'll often hear that 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 futurist will use metaphors. Okay, so what is your metaphor for yeah. getting there? What is your story? Um, and, and 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 that's basically so 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 we're not we never i mean any futurist that says to you he or she can predict the future is you know yeah, stay yeah, away you've got to run run a <laughs> mile run a mile absolutely absolutely <laughs> so what we do is we anticipate what futures there might be and then and we reverse engineer that now if i can just carry on a little bit on that little tangent is is this sure. this is where the futurist role comes to the fore in that as a futurist, you have to be extremely well read. In other words, yeah. you have to consume information, oodles, truckloads of information. You have to read more than the average person by far. Mm. You have to watch, unfortunately, long form um, discussions on the various topics that you're interested in. Um, yeah. But it has to be long form. It can't be these little snippets and these little memes that we all um, so guilty of engaging in the, so the often. candy of the internet at the moment the candy of the internet exactly yeah. and just incidentally yeah. uh, i don't know if you know where, where the term comes from um in in the 70s mid 70s a guy by the name of richard dawkins wrote a book called the selfish gene okay now yeah. where we where we are very familiar with genetics and the way that our you know genetic code is sort of hardwired into who we are, he coined the phrase meme, um, meaning that this is what makes us us cognitively, all right? Mm. So in other words, the, the influences that you've come from or that you've been exposed to growing up, um, your school, high school, primary school, had a, had a very peculiar or a peculiar language, a yes. peculiar way of speaking, different to your neighboring school even, all right? Um, the creeds that you used to follow, different to your neighboring school. Uh, no matter whether it's a company, whether it's a school, whether it's a town, Cape Town, distinctly different to Port Elizabeth. So, so we all emanate from our own mimetic universes, if you want. So, so that's where the term meme comes from. So, so a meme is just a short little snapshot of who you are 
Yes. And, and today we communicate via memes. So, so again, you know, stay away. Like you said, the candy, the candy of the internet. Yeah. Um, but, but, but that's just, you know, so we also have to understand when it comes to sense making, when it comes to speaking to your client or to anybody mm. is, is that stand that they, they come to the, to the, to the discussion, let's call it. They come to the table from a completely different mimetic universe to you. The influences were completely different. Okay, so so yeah. we have to we have to find that 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 sort of middle, and we have to whittle that down um, when it comes to exactly. when it comes to finding the truth and then making sense in terms of how it is that we move forward. Yeah, and I think you touched on such a great point there of the sort of humility. Of the process um where it's like an understanding both our very uh reptilian mammalian nature but yeah. but also this this uniquely human ability to to imagine and and create uh with yes. without without predefined goals set it's and and i think that's possibly where uh the the difference between strategy and I suppose innovation is as usual and as what has been done and, and works still very well to to what is more of a futures orientated approach um, is in that strategic thinking process is uh, as opposed to sort of coming from from the inside our organization, our team, this is what we do, this is our industry. And then maybe if we have time to look at the rest of the world that's impacting on us, where yeah. uh, the, the future's thinking is, no, you are one small piece in the rest of the world and the rest of the world's impacting you and you've got to figure out how to orientate, adapt and transform yourself in context of that, uh, which which I think is is, is a bit more of a, it's more humility in the sense of your place in the world and 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 then figuring out okay how do we uh go with that understanding go to strategic planning of what do we do now and how do we right. do it best yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely i think i think you touched on something that 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 i try and apply as much as i as much as i can Firstly, okay, when it comes to this mimetic universe, um, we, we all have different biases in life, all right? You're going mm. to come with to, to the table with some form of bias. So, so when it comes to, to us uh, engaging, us being futurists, engaging with a client or with a person or with a group or peers even, yeah, we, we have to display, I'm not, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, with the Hegelian dialectic process. So, sure. so Hegel um, came up with, with, he never used the terminology that I'm going to mention now, but, but he came up with this process. And I think you'll, you'll, you'll relate to it immediately. Um, and, you know, being, you know, having studied, you, you will obviously relate to it more. Mm. But, but when it comes to a particular subject challenge, you, you have to have some sort of hypothesis. You have to come to the table with an hypothesis. Okay, there, there is this thing. Okay, that I want to unpack and, and 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 dissect. Then looking at at that hypothesis, you're going to say, "All right, um, here is my thesis around the, this particular thing. All right, mm. whatever it is. So this is my thesis. Water is a fluid. Okay, that's my thesis. Yeah. Now I'm going to come out with that thesis, and, and I'm going to discuss to him and say, Daniel, water is a fluid." And you're going to go, yes, but, all right, if water is exposed to temperatures below zero degrees, um, it's going to be a solid, all right? Yes. So th th that's then the hypothesis, all right? So so then you come up, or not the hypothesis, the, the, the antithesis, all right? Hmm. So you come up and you say to me, hang on, this is, this is another state of water. And we'll go, yeah, you know, we're right. Water can be a, a liquid or it can be a solid. And yeah. as we discuss and as we talk, somebody else might come in, and then that's our <laughs> new, let's call it thesis, you know, and then somebody yeah. else will come, hang on, hang on, hang on. You know, I boiled water the other day and it, and it evaporated. So it can also be a gas. So that process has to 
has to be churned around as much as you possibly can to get to your th synthesis, all right, to, to mm. your final thesis, if you want. That's the process that you got to undertake to to get your client or your peer or whatever to to come to the to the truth. Now you can say, right, based on this, we we want to go in that direction. Okay. Now yeah. now now what you said was so vitally true in humility. You call it humility. I, you know we've got to we've got to display a sense of honesty comes to the party immediately, and then vulnerability. I have to be vulnerable enough to come to you and say this magnificent thesis of mine mm. that, that I'm bringing to you saying water is a liquid. I've got to be vulnerable enough and honest enough to, to, to understand that I'm coming to you with this because you're going to, you're going to add to the, to the process. You're going to add yes. to the, the, the system, the methodology or whatever it might be. Mm. And you and I then have to jointly be um, humble enough to say, Okay, there might be a third person with a with a with another theory. Yeah. Let's do that. That's the only way. Um, and, and I think looking at where we are now, the future is definitely heading into that direction. With all of the AI, with all of the chat GPT, with all of the mm. large language models. I, I just completed my my first newsletter for LinkedIn this morning. Congrats. And I wanted to do something yesterday and I said, let me just prove a point by letting chat gpt do this little thing for me you know do a little okay. bit of a summary and i went into chat gpt and, and the system was dead open ai all of their systems were dead and and that sort of beautifully proved my point is that how reliant can we be on an ai or a system or a tool or a whatever it might be a computer to give us information mm. are we going to be so reliant that when that GPT system of ours goes offline that we're going to be we we just fall apart going to function anymore so so that proved my point to a degree and 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 I and I'm and I'm hopeful that that that's why this outreach I think between you and I as well is that 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 we start discussing these things because we need to be honest enough with each other to say hang on have you thought of this that not not I think this that's why it is right Daniel, why don't we look at this avenue? And and, and mm. I'm sure that, that with that process, this whole, I call it the Hegelian dialectic process, that we will ultimately come to the truth. Now, that goes a little bit beyond the scope of a, of a future because you've got to have your client's goal in mind, but for them to understand what the hard truth is, if only Kodak some years ago had a futurist that did that for them, they would have yeah. still been around. Because they, they they developed the digital camera, but they wanted to hold on to to film, you know, as being their their major income stream. Exactly. And Kodak Kodak ain't no more, you know. So so yeah. if, if only Kodak had a futurist to say to them, or a future minded person at least, yes. you know, look at this. This is what's going to happen, and have enough gumption at least to say to your CEO or the board or whatever, mm. this is what's going. And these are my reasons. And, and you know, I, I hope that more companies uh, em, embrace that. Unfortunately, yeah. um, you know, companies, they, they reach out for futures uh, or, or, or futurists once the disruption has happened. Then, it, then it's almost a little bit once too late. The trends are already hitting them. That, that's uh, right. That's right. That's why, as you know, as a futurist, we look for weak signals. If a signal is strong, the the the, the horse is bolted. You know that mm. that trend is already on its way. We we look for for weaker signals that that might have an impact. And yeah, and yeah, um, you know that, think, that's uh, just yeah, just touching on some of your points. There is like um, so there's there's a broad set of sort of principles, values, orientations to futures work. Uh, and I think uh, humility, imagination, collaboration, cooperation, those are sort of, I would say, the, the ethos behind the field. Yes. And yes. I think you also started touching on sort of steps in a seemingly circular, linear, whichever process you choose yes. 
to, to conduct this process. Um, mm. So it might be nice to just suggest how, how now it's sort of the, the doing of this. Um, yes. I mean, I come from the natural foresight framework from the right. future. Right. Um, okay. But yeah, I mean, so do you have any points on like to to bring the the rigor and the structure to this otherwise creative, imaginative process? Um, if you you can just speak to that. Okay. So so what I tend to to want to do is 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 try and convince. Um, the company, the client, to bring as many people to the table as possible, mm. right? Um, from within their company, so that they can. The you, you talk about humility, and this is part of part of what what you need to look at is, as a futurist, do not try and be the smartest person in the room. Okay, Th mm. that's not what what we want. Although you you would have prepared and understood the the client's industry where they're wanting to go, the broader picture in terms of, um, you know, the signals and the trends and that sort of thing. Um, you let them talk. Okay? Yeah. You let them speak. And and you're going to find that that nine times out of ten, the how to fix the thing normally comes from the lowest tiers of, of that business. Okay? Closest to the problem. Um, yeah, because yeah, they, they face that problem every day. They don't face the spreadsheets and the balance sheets and directors' meetings and all that sort of thing. They they face the harsh reality of how this business needs to needs mm. to move forward, or the organisation. So so based on that, I, I like workshopping. All right. So so based on that, you 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 sort of say, okay, we've identified where you want to where you want to go. We've identified what your preferred future is. Now let's draw a map. Okay. How do we map? So you map the 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 path for them all right then you look at anticipating so and your anticipatory process in terms of okay this and that and that might go wrong okay how, yes. how do we overcome that when it gets there when we get there um i'm not familiar if you or not i don't know if you're familiar with ryan holiday uh the author yeah great stoic yeah there's the stoic and the the obstacle is the way um, oh, is, 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 is a brilliant book. Um, yeah. In other words, anticipate and understand and know that you will there will be there will be obstacles in your way. How do you over overcome that obstacle and how do you how do you prepare for that eventuality? Mm. Once that happens, you go into the deepening process. In other words, okay, these are the finer points. Th this is exactly what what we're looking at in terms of forging our path. Okay. And then, um, you know, obviously within that, you look at you look at the the alternatives that there might be, yes. um, might come to the fore, and then the transformation process. All right. So, so you know, it's something that we won't be able to unpack, but I'll be happy to do it in a in a in a future uh, session. Is is um, mm. uh, the Meta Futures six pillars uh, method of of um, defining futures? You know, and how how yeah. to get there. But I think in terms of of of, of preparing yourself for for that, um, you know, obviously uh, you mentioned it, and you know, re just reiterating the fact that humility plays a big role. Um, don't be the smartest person in the room, and mm. and, and listen and understand. Uh, it, it's a strange old thing that that you know. It, it seems to me it sometimes feels that our world is driven by a few people. Um, yeah. I saw on one of your on one of your LinkedIn articles that you you made mention of the Mark Andreessen mm. uh, um, <laughs> article that he that he posted, and and we must understand that for sure he's going to write what he did because he's got agency, he's got an yes. interest to drive that narrative, it's and he's got power to drive that narrative. So, so yes, we, we must understand that that's that's always going to happen. But how do we how do we come up with a counterintuitive or a counter argument to that and say, mm. but hang on, you know this this is what we need to look at. Yeah, um, and that's, sometimes that's, yeah. Carry on, sorry. No, no, sorry, sorry. I was just going to say that's where the 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 challenger orientation must come in. Is yes. that um, 
Uh, I mean, obviously, you've you've got to gauge just how much challenging you can do without <laughs> without getting fired or or being willing sure. to get fired for those challenging. Um, sure, sure. And yeah, it's it's you've got to be the provocateur of uh, for for those maybe not in the room who don't have a voice or those perspectives yes. that don't have voices. So yes. I think that's where you've you've almost got to decide what kind of futurist you want to be. Um, mm -hmm. is, are you are you gonna you know feed them what they want to hear? Um, and these are the trick tech trends, and you're on course and let's just keep doing what you're doing um or you're going to be like listen um i'm afraid you're yeah, you, you, what you're doing right now if you can imagine five years from now uh you're going to be irrelevant or, or so, yeah. not not in those such harsh words but um and uh yeah i guess just on the this there's, there's just so many tools and tricks that one can apply to allow others to come to those conclusions. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe what what are some of like your because because as I, I've come to learn is like having a few set tools that you use that you're comfortable with, competent with, that you enjoy using uh, is is a is a great start to being a futurist. Um, are, are there specific tools that that you would suggest as as sort of essentials? In a toolbox of a futurist the main thing I'm, I, I try and keep things very simple um mm. although I've, I've done these various courses but but i like looking at i i, I don't know if you ever used the future wheel or futures wheel okay? yes it's, it's a simple, yeah. just, just a simple little little thing that you that you sit there with with whoever you're sitting with and you're saying right let's look at the future of autonomous vehicles Mm. Your center little circle is the autonomous vehicles, and then you have the direct repercussions of establishing in South Africa, in whatever country, autonomous vehicles. Yeah. So what are the first, what is the first diameter of, of new circles around that circle going to be? So what would it be? Firstly, um, what? Drive, okay, so, so we're looking at driver, driverless cars, then you're looking at, okay, yeah. manufacturing. So what is the manufacturing process of driver, driverless cars? And how yes. is manufacturing going to impact on, on all of its associated industries, all right? Yeah. Um, do, do we realize that that when it comes to driverless vehicles, that, that the smart part of driverless vehicles will not necessarily be encased in the computer chip of the car, but it will be mm -hmm. in your road. All right, because your car is going to be too expensive to build if it has to carry all of that capacity of understanding what's happening in the, the whole of Cape Town when yeah. it comes to a driverless vehicle. So so edge computing comes to the fore. So so how do we educate a bunch of kids these days to 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 yes. or to, how do we sensitize them to look at okay, this is what edge computing is all about. Okay, that's that's the process that's going to drive the car. All the car is going to do is communicate with the various information nodes along the way to yeah. say to Daniel's self-driving car when he's on his way to wherever yes. that there, there was a problem on this road. There's congestion here. We're going to take a different route. And route. old Siri will come to you in your car while you're driving and say to you, listen, Daniel, we're going to take a detour. <clears throat> this is the route that we're going to yeah so so i like a futures wheel that's that's the main thing that i use and then like i said i use workshops and, I, and then i do this mapping anticipating timing deepening um creating alternates and and transforming then then i, I go yeah. from from there and i come back um and i look at and i look at sort of distilling all of that information for them so that they ultimately you want them to make the decision for themselves you you yeah. don't want to make that decision yeah. um and and you know that's just how we how we move it forward exactly um, and, and and basically that's it yeah that that futures wheel also so useful because it it instills a a futures thinking mindset of uh first order second order third order of uh, yes. consequences of of decisions <clears throat> so it's almost a, it's like a decision making tool um yes 
and yes. and I also love how you can sort of block it out into um, steep so society technology or social technological economic environmental political um, and, and so you don't have a what uh, Yvette uh, from the future school likes to say is educated incapacity it's yes oh man you're yeah. a technologist you know the technology but you have no idea what's going on socially economically that's so right it forces you to broaden your horizon um yeah, yeah. that's a great topic. absolutely that that that's vital and and you probably <clears throat> excuse me spend most of your time with that futures wheel because mm -hmm. you get it wrong there the whole next of the process is going to be a little bit skewed um sometimes what you just mentioned is so true sometimes our our, our actions, however noble we think they are, are, are deleterious in, to the degree that that we, we want to leave a legacy for our kids, for instance. But in leaving that legacy, we, we, we like you said, we, we, we have these little blinkers on and we think that our information is good and right. And we send them out into the ocean with, with this magnificent, high-tech, instantly inflatable, well-equipped life raft but we give them snow boots with six inch spikes on them, you know, to, yeah. to navigate on, on an inflatable boat. Our intentions are great. The application might not work the way that we that we want to. So so we need to, you know, you hash and you rehash that that completely. Exactly. But talking about about driverless vehicles, for instance, and and um, and electric vehicles. I mean, it's something yeah. that's coming and it's something that's that's being driven by by a number of people. But we also need to understand that that we live in a resource constrained world. You know, is there if you had to replace every single um, internal combustion engine driven vehicle today with an electric vehicle, there's, will there be enough? I'm not going to make the statement. Will there be enough raw materials lithium. for us to yeah. be able to do that? Not never mind the lithium. What about yeah. iron ore? What about copper? What about all the other things to make a driverless vehicle? Um, do exactly that. Be driverless. So, so there's a guy that I'm going to suggest you you look at. Um, he appears on a on a podcast by a guy by the name of Nate Nate Hagen. Nate Huggins. Huggins, yeah. yeah I, Nate. I, I, so I Simon Michaud. Yeah, I was listening yeah, yeah. To him. yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. Simon Michaud is is one of his regular guests, and and this guy is is. Is extremely good at explaining, um, you know, what we what we have to look at. Now, I've I've been engaged a number of times in in and I still am in in circular economy related projects. You know, mm. so so even even like I said, you know, sometimes these these efforts of ours are a little bit deleterious in the in the sense that we oh man, circular economy has got to be the greatest thing. You know. For, for the for the next ten years, but when you unpack when you unpack the reality of it, um, we got to sort of say, okay, instead of looking at at a a circular economy, let's look at a resource managed economy. All right, we what about this transition period? You know, people are saying get rid of of of, of um, fossil fuels and all that sort of thing, but there's going to be a transition period for a number of years that that we have to look at and and you know it's it's just the reality you you cannot for the life of me tell me that and and i mean i i don't like uh coal powered fire station uh, uh, power stations especially in south africa because of the junk that we have to pile yes. into them to get a little bit of electricity out of it yeah but if you had to look at wind and if you had to look at solar and all of these technologies that that come to the fore is it not more realistic to say that in 10 years or 15 years from now we're going to have a a basket of different service providers providing the grid with energy with electricity mm. right? be that solar be that whatever it might be um you know whatever they're going to figure out in, in 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 the future as far as that is concerned yeah but 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 we can't just because it's the right buzz term or phrase sort yes. of negate that defenestrate everybody that proposes that <laughs> you know, it so we need to be realistic when it when it comes to that sort of thing 
yeah. um, I'm, I'm busy working with on a project like I told you with with uh, as far as the future of food is concerned Huge and future. and even yeah. that you know we, we've got a we've got to really think um, and ask ourselves the question do I do I want to subscribe to artificially produced lab grown meat in the future do I want to subscribe to some sort of weird genetic genetically altered crop because it sounds great and it looks good and it can do all of these things but what about the, 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 the those with motive behind that process the moment you alter a, a particular crop um, mm. maize for instance to, to 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 be able to survive in more arid conditions the maize. moment you alter that molecule that company owns the molecule you can't do anything about that you can't yeah you can't propagate you can't carry on with that so we got to look at the the motive with those that have agency in these various technologies as well a la mark andreessen you know why would mark andreessen who is one of the biggest investors in in silicon valley drive a little article like that yeah other than to serve his own memes you know um so so we've got to be very mindful of this and and something that i've seen that comes to the fore now um instead of the the buzzword if you want being circular economy people are now talking about regenerative everything yes. <laughs> okay regenerative fuel economy regenerative manufacturing economy instead of circular which makes a lot of sense um yeah. yeah when it comes to when it comes to food there's a very harsh reality that we have to look at we have to find the balance as far as the nexus between energy food and water is concerned and and if we can't do that we won't be able to feed the world the no. however many 10 billion people in 2050 so and those are the things that we need to extract yeah and it's it's i mean just that's where that focal issue becomes so interesting so like where what what future are you focusing on yes. and i used food as such a great example um and I, I just can't help but move to the point of like as a futurist or becoming a futurist establishing yourself uh i think one of the main starting points which which i got advised and which which i'm pursuing and it i feel like it's working well is you've got to decide what's your community your tribe of futures thinkers and sort of what what kind of future are they trying to create and how and uh, i think from there you will you will then find your your tribe uh, who speak That's the right. same language who speak the same language who do the same work because yes I, I think i'm i'm personally and and once you do that you will diff your curiosity will take you down a rabbit hole <laughs> of yes. people Absolutely. and Absolutely. theories and um and you just touching on nate huggins the great simplification um, yes i think my main inspiration has been daniel schmachtenberger and like oh, yeah. Yeah. Nora Patterson, because um, mm. yeah, then if you follow this curiosity further enough, you you really get down to the mechanisms with which our world operates and mm -hmm. the underlying principles, assumptions that that have got us into what what some call the meta crisis um, yes. or the poly crisis or the time between worlds. Um, yeah. So I think in, in, in that, um, maybe a next step is, uh, for so assuming you've chosen your tribe and you know, round about what sort of approach you want to go with to apply futures, the orientation you're going with, um, yes. what, what would you say are the, the sort of main ways, roles that people hold as a futurist? So consultant in-house that sort of thing um what what would you say is the main ways people work as futurists okay um just just from a purely practical point of view is is you know a disseminator of of information but not just information you know of let's call it filtered information all right 
Um, and you've got to be, again, very mindful of the fact that, um, again, coming to the smartest person in the room type of thing, is that because you've had to read and research a particular topic, a particular mm. signal or a way that things might be happen, it might be going, that that you don't become authoritative in 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 the way that you communicate to your client or to yeah, if you're embedded in a company, for instance, yeah. um, to your boss, um, that that you, you sort of disseminate and and you and you and you distribute that information um, as as openly and as broadly as possible, but also giving them then obviously the the, the the various potential outcomes that there might be okay they need to make the decision ultimately you're not going to be ever yeah. a decision maker all right um to, you mustn't fall into that trap so with, with if you're embedded into into a company it's it, it might be slightly more difficult um to 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 produce what you what you need because you're going to have to follow the company line or you have yes. to tow the company line and the company narrative, yeah. but but being an, an independent futurist is is what I like because I, I, you know typical of I, I don't mind sharing bad information or sharing bad news. <laughs> you know you yes. have to <laughs> unfortunately they pay you to do um, that. Yeah, they pay you to do that, but you've also got to do it in 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 a manner that 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 you know ultimately what you want them to do is to see the light the, in terms uh -huh. of your research. In terms of what you've done you know you want you want to let them come up and say oh okay this is this is the thing you know this is the solution this is the way that we've got to go um and you and you're talking about this this big reset um people if if you go to anybody you look at you look look at the, the people that you've mentioned nate hagen's um uh Daniel Schmachtenberger, for instance, you know they they they're gonna they're gonna call it the way it is, but in a very very articulate way, and they're gonna give it to you in such a to such a degree that you you're gonna feel like okay, you know what this guy is saying is really makes a lot of sense. Um, interestingly, you, you talk about about um, Nate, for instance, with his what does he call what is his uh, the great the, simplification simplification. When when the the World Economic Forum came out with this big reset, I think that's where he came with this great simplification. I wrote an article um, that during that time that that calls for critical adjustments. Okay, yeah. so so as we go along, you know, what are these critical adjustments that we are going to make? Some big, yes. some small, um, to, to be able to 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 adjust to the future. So so again, you know, what are those critical adjustments and and you need to to paint that picture for your client. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you you need to sort of be even even in in your scoping meetings before the time. You you have to sort of say to them, "This you know, I might not bring you the best of news." You know, but yeah. but I must say that that with, as far as some of the people that I've that I've dealt with, um, and and li listening to uh, Inayatola, for instance, is that. Is that they've driven people in, into completely different directions? Some mm. companies, you know, um, like like for instance, uh, uh, he mentioned a, a, a story, uh, an experience that he had with a logistics company. You know, with okay. man, if if everybody starts three D printing, what are we as a logistics company going to move one day? What yes. what are we going to ship? And they had a workshop, and 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 the, and the net result was we're going to be shipping 3D printing machine components to and fro, <laughs> you wow. know. So, so they said to themselves, okay, this is what's going to happen, you know, because even even this little project of of, of mine that I'm busy with, I'm looking at small farms, um, quite simply because if we have to feed let's call it 10 billion people in 2050, where is that food going to come from? It's not, you can't come to this little farm that I'm established on at the moment and, and come and erect a Dutch glass house. It's just going to be too expensive. It's, it's impossible. Mm. There's not enough resource for that financially, physically. Um, and, and you look at from, from where I'm sitting, the, the, this, the ocean is two and a half kilometers down. 
to myself right. behind me. You look at right. all the way from here, right up to people that I'm working with in the Mediterranean, for instance, is that most of your farms, 80% plus of your farms in this region and big parts of Europe are smaller than five hectares. All right? mm. So small farms, is they will be the future of food production. It's not going to be your mega, massive, big farms. Yeah. And the, the, the practice that people will hopefully um, employ is, is regenerative farming. That means it's a single family farmer that's going to produce all of that. Now, what I'm busy doing is, is we're busy developing certain tools because your farmer is typically older than 60 years of age. Yeah. So we remove the drudgery and say, okay, let, let's now see how we can incorporate robotics and AI into a small farm wow. at a price that's affordable, but still supplementary to the farmer, not replacing the farmer not replacing the systems. Because if you look at AI and, and robotics, um, it's still very binary, very empirical. It's a zero mm. or a one, mm. all right? And that's the way that AI thinks. Whereas life and, and soil health and plant health and our lives and our health is way more liminal. We, we live between the tick and the tock on a clock, the on and <laughs> off on a computer, you know? Yeah, it's it. it's that, that's what we've got to look after, and that's what we've got to nurture. So, so let's not dispel AI and, and robotics, but, but yeah. rather get them to supplement and to augment what it is that we're doing, removing the drudgery. Um, uh, what is his name? Gerd, Gerd, Gerd Leonard. Okay. Very I'm not familiar. prominent yeah. futurist. You can follow him. Very prominent futurist. He's a humanist futurist. Okay. So similar to, I think, what you and I are. Team, so, team so, human. So, team human, absolutely. <laughs> so, so he will, he, he sort of has that, that, that same saying. And he, and he says, you know, like if, if you do a, a robot's work, if you work like a robot, if there's repetition in your daily job, you're going to be yeah. replaced by a robot. So think a little bit. Now, love them or hate them, the World Economic Forum's their job study came out a little while back. I don't know if you've seen that. Okay. But interestingly enough, what, what comes to the fore is that agriculture and regenerative agriculture is going to be one of the big job drivers in the future, all right? Mm. And, 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 and machine operators, call it machine or equipment operators within the farming industry is going to be one of the big drivers as well. So your farmer is not going to be a tractor driving, uh, spade wielding person in the future. They're going to be robotics manipulators they're going to be drone pilots yes. they're going to be all of you know so so your farmer is going to be a highly skilled person in the future yeah. so look at that um augmented augment, aug this, this augmented um yeah. not reality because we're not going to be wearing goggles and that sort of thing but but yeah. um but but they they augment they, they assist us so uh, robotics and ai can be our assistance rather than taking yeah. over the process completely yeah. So okay. that's an interesting part of it. Um, and then obviously the big thing in the future as far as jobs are concerned is, is going to be around centered around AI and robotics. So your self-driving car knocks somebody by accident on the road. Um, your vehicle, you didn't drive. Somebody wrote the code for this thing. The, the, the edge computing system for the smart car was written, the algorithm was written by somebody else. Who takes culpability? Who, who takes ownership of that accident? Who, who gets yeah. sued by the pedestrian that gets knocked by the, the car? You, the owner? Yeah. So, so even in terms of the legal fraternity, they've got to start looking forward towards that. Um, talking about that, um, some people didn't like it the other day when I, when I presented a talk and I, there were some legal minds there. And I said to them, what do you think of, of this future is that let's say in five years time in South Africa, the property register down the street from you, okay, it goes on to the blockchain. All right. Mm. So, so what happens then? You, you, you affect the transaction today, tomorrow the house is yours. Yeah. Transferred because you don't have to go into the register anymore to, to do the transfer. So every conveyancing department of every law firm in South Africa, that's basically the backbone of where they earn their money from is going to disappear. Yeah. Same with the transaction. So, and so your legal people have to start thinking as well in, in, in different. Yeah. 
I think you've in in sort of suggesting these different um, like law or lawyers. Um, yes. This, this is what I found interesting in, in my investigation is that yes, there's a you are a futurist as a consultant or in-house futurist. Um, yes. Uh, but there's also the path of you've got your profession, say lawyer, and yes. you attach futures thinking and futures and strategic foresight to your current profession. So you're sort yes. of possibly futures of law or futures of yes. um, of work. I, th I think it's quite a prominent one. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's also to say like, not necessarily there's, there's only one way to be a, a, pre a career practicing futurist. Um, so I, I think, mm. yeah. And, and, and I think where would you say are uh, more the operational areas where futures is used? Uh, I know, I know product is quite like, they've got that futures design. It's quite well established. Um, yes. Where would you say are the other sort of departments or if, if someone's looking to present themselves to a company, wh where would the best places be uh, or all the possible ways that their careers could fill in based on their previous work experience? Okay. I think you've mentioned just that uh, design futures for sure is, is one thing, but then I've also, I also did a, a very, now that you mentioned it, did a very interesting um, course some years back called designing the future of work. In other wow. words, you know, even, even when it comes to the, to the, let's call it the softer issues, you know, um, where you, you, you don't necessarily manufacture something, but you design the future of work in, banking for instance all mm. right so 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 what is banking going to look like i mean it, it it's no secret that that any administrative task um bank tellers yeah. data capturers all of the, those those jobs are going to start disappearing so so how do you then um how do you propose a a, a an agreement with a bank and say to them let's look at the future of where banking is going to go Okay, mm. because your tellers are going to disappear um, completely. Uh, your 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 filing clocks are going to disappear completely. So so even the softer issues, not, not necessarily only manufacturing, but designing the future of work, especially. And I think Daniel, that that's possibly even something that you can look at is 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 <clears throat> where the disruption is going to happen um, in the negative. In other words. Where yeah. is it going to influence people negatively? Because although there there will be new jobs created by by AI and the systems and the and the and you know um, by the robotics and all that sort of thing, is the jobs that are going to be created aren't necessarily going to, necessarily going to be filled by the people that are, that are going to lose their jobs. All yes. Right. So 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 that's very important. Um, so, so yes, I, I think the future of work and, and, and your soft skills, um, you know, that are going to be affected, uh, you, you need to, to have a look at as well. So, so it's definitely manufacturing. It's, it's uh, you know, the, a very, very big one. Um, if you can find it, um, grab onto it with both hands, is, is to look at, at um, governments and policymakers. Um, okay. Because th they're going to ultimately drive the whole process all right mm. um and i must say there's some there's some very forward-thinking leaders up in africa um not necessarily we don't, we don't always hear about them but but they certainly they're there yeah um so, so you look at policy makers you, you look at you look at town planning for instance town planners and and um you know doctors and and all that sort of thing is is how are these soft skills going to be going to be impacted and and what mm. can i do to assist them with that um yeah. and then uh, you know what what typically what i do is i i prefer the consulting role um mm. because i think that's the best for a futurist is is that you know we we, we have a varied um range of 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 subjects that that interest us uh, you might find a niche, you might find something that's really, really interesting to you, like this food future of food project is my legacy yes. project, something that I've always wanted to do. But it's so all encompassing. It it, it involves microgrids for electricity. Yeah. It involves 
um, um, endogenous growth programs for for towns in the future what is your future town going to look like why why when when you walk onto a farm are we so wired as human beings that you just relax you walk onto a farm and it's just like oh okay i feel relaxed or in, into a into a, a rural yes. town you know you go into a rural town and there's just this feeling and it and it comes from something that we can't quite articulate Mm. So, so you're f with connectivity and the internet and everything else that goes with it. When when you look at the little town over the over the hill from us here, what what might that town look like in the future? Yes, there will be 3D printing. There will be all sorts of weird and wonderful things. There will be IT companies looking after the the very systems that I spoke to you about. Yeah. Does that not lend itself for a for an eco village where where people can come and work remotely? You know, from that site experiencing the, the 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 countryside if you want the the ruralness of it all being being able to be away from from the towns and the cities and the hustle and the bustle so what is your future town going to look like what is the logistics train going to look like between between towns and, and cities yeah um, i call it charter villages or charter corridors in 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 direct correlation to charter cities i don't know if you're familiar with charter cities yeah the future of a, uh, future of urbanization or whatever you urbanization yes that's, yeah yeah if you look at shenzhen in in china for instance is a is yes. a perf dubai perfect examples yeah. of that yeah. so so but i'm talking about charter corridors in other words what links the support systems for the for the charter cities or your cities then to to mm. To the rural economy so yeah and, and and yeah i mean you've got it you've got food you've got productivity you've got robotics you've got everything else in in the future so yeah so a very wide scope of, of water management for instance so so that's what i prefer what i like doing however if somebody had to come to me and say um we're a we're a logistics company please have a look at at, mm. at helping us understand where the future of logistics is going to be then for sure you'll do it um you know but but yeah so so manufacturing um obviously robotics and ai those systems um and then and then the soft the softer yeah. skills you know the exactly. future of work the future of, of soft skills uh education uh, don't yeah. you know, <laughs> don't get me going um so what what is your what is your yeah, yeah, I mean, for, for, for any, for any young person.